Hey, today's episode brought to you in part by SunsetLakeCebedee.com's Valentine Edible Sale. That's right. Uh, starting today at 6 a.m. this morning, Eastern Time, all Sebede edibles are 30% off. Use the coupon code SWEET at checkout. The sale ends, of course, on uh, Valentine's Day. But you want to treat yourself on Valentine's Day? Or uh, you got somebody else uh, you want to get gifts for? Give yourself some better sleep. Or give them better sleep. Or better yet, some vibes. That's right. Until February 14th, you can save 30% on Sunset Lake Sabbath Day edibles. That means they're Sabbath Day fudge. It's 30% off. Their Sebede coffee, 30% off. All of their gummies, the Vibe gummies with a little bit of THC. The, um, where are these other ones? Where are the rest? Where are my, who stole my gummies? I don't know. Oh, oh, oh this one right here. This is, uh, <laughs> I've been hitting these pretty hard lately. These are uh, focus gummies. Empty. <laughs> yeah, it's practically empty. Uh, Sebede, Lion's Mane, and Cordyceps. They have also uh, one for relaxing with Ashwanga uh, mushrooms. And they also have the uh, sleep gummies. I don't know why I have these here. <laughs> I should never take these at work. Um, but they, um, uh, and then they have just the, the straight uh, sour Sebede gummies. All of them, including the ones with the THC, uh, 30% off. Just use the code SWEET at checkout. Uh, these gummies are great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm popping the focus ones all the time these days. Um, but also, uh, this, uh, all of their products, third-party tested. You can see uh, the breakdown on their website of what's in specifically each one of these different uh, uh, gummies or edibles. Uh, a great company, Movement Partners, given thousands upon thousands of dollars to strike relief funds and Planned Parenthood and uh, carceral reform and, uh, food pantries and uh, flood relief. Uh, it just goes on and on. I think we're going to do another thing with them, uh, soon too. Treat yourself and your loved ones to some tasty Seba day this Valentine's day. What a great gift. Do the whole package. Head to sunset lake, Place your order before February 14th. Get 30% off. See their website for terms and conditions. And of course, the link will be in the podcast, YouTube and at majority.fm. Showtime. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me. And I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday. February 7th, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Aaron Reed, independent journalist and author of the Aaron in the Morning newsletter on Substack, to uh, update us on the tremendous anti-trans legislation spreading across the country just in this year alone. Then, Margie Mason and Robin McDowell, investigative reporters for the Associated Press, on their two-year investigation into the use of prison labor and hundreds of popular food brands. And then, in the fun half, um, hot off the heels of his uh, journalistic breakthrough on the um, Tim Pool's Diarrhea Gate, uh, Tim Heidecker will be here with us. First, Republicans blow their vote on impeaching 
Department of Homeland Secretary Amay Orcus. Meanwhile, uh, as the uh, border for supplemental deal implodes, Democrats now forced to embrace a myth about invasion and chaos from our southern border. Clean Israel funding bill fails in the House as the Senate tees up a Ukraine and Israel funding package. Meanwhile, federal appeals court finds Trump is not immune from prosecution on election subversion. And they also forced a fast track appeal to SCOTUS. That being the Supreme Court of the United States. Joe Biden wins in the Nevada primary and Nikki Haley loses to, quote, none of the above. Oof. UAW announces over 50% of the workers in the Chattanooga Volkswagen plant have signed union cards now. That's a big deal. Rona McDaniel ejected from her RNC chair as of mid-February. Eh, maybe not so much of a big deal. Yeah. Romney McDaniel. Romney. Rona Romney McDaniel. <laughs> Never forget. Meanwhile, the IRS uh, reports audits of millionaires dropped 70% from 2010 to 2019. Audits of large corporations during that same time by 50%. That is no longer the case as the IRS funding is now um, bringing more audits of millionaires and bringing in more funds. Surprise, that's the way it works. Uh oh. All this <laughs> and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, little out of sorts. We got a lot of stuff to cover today. A lot of news. A lot of guests. And uh, it is indeed, of course, Hump Day. That's right. Hello. Yep. Uh, we're not going to go through the normal uh, banter about how it's your trade, uh, Mark. Uh, no, we uh, don't have time. Catchphrase. We but don't have time understand. for that uh, type of stuff. Yes. Uh, a lot of stuff happened yesterday in the House. Um, the Israel funding bill uh, standalone failed. 43 Democrats voted for it. Uh, I think it was a 12 or 11 Republicans voted against it. It needed two thirds, which is increasingly common in uh, this uh, Republican controlled Congress, but rare in our legislative history. And the reason why it needs two thirds is because. The conservative flank, or there's always somebody, it seems, in the Republican caucus who is not assenting to the rules. Really, basically, they, they call it the rule. It is the primary rule of, uh, and, and, and it is ne rarely ever this way. Usually, caucuses, Democratic and Republican, all agree, we vote for the rule, essentially, which says the rule is that we're going to, uh, have our uh, passage of bills uh, based on a 50% uh, or 50% plus one uh, majority. And that's it. The um, there are members of the Republican caucus now who are uh, pissed at Mike uh, Johnson. They're pissed at Kevin McCarthy. They're just pissed and they force stuff to become a two thirds um, uh, to make for a two thirds threshold. Uh, and in this case, uh, you had only 43 Democrats who were voting for it. And uh, so the bill failed. Uh, all the Republicans more or less voted for it. Now, this was a bill that uh, Joe Biden said he would veto because he wants that Ukraine funding as well. And now in the Senate, we're seeing a Ukraine and Israel funding bill uh, about to get voted on. I don't know if it's going to happen today, but it's going to happen within the next couple of days, if not. So that's that on that side. But good news on that front. Good well, news that, I mean, Biden would, says he would veto it. But I do think that the fact that there were only, what, 43, 46 Democrats that joined it, usual suspects to like Gottheimer and Quayar and Debbie Wasserman. Some progressives Schultz, that I think we would be unhappy about. But, but, uh, but uh, like Adam Schiff voted for it. Katie Porter didn't. 
Um, uh, Gallego, uh, Gallego, who's running for Senate Gallego? in Arizona. Yeah. Gallego, sorry, running for Senate in Arizona, did vote for it, which is disappointing. But point is, like, there are rumblings that opposition to more aid to Israel on the Democratic side is is more per, uh, the, the the number of house democrats who are, are shaky about it is probably higher than we're seeing in the press and um so now let's move on to the uh the the immigration bill has completely imploded but just the idea that now we're calling it the immigration bill yeah. is a, a sign of the failure of the biden administration i know i went on a protracted rant about this uh, in the fun half yesterday uh, we talked about it for quite some time. It wasn't in the fun house. No, no, it was the, the, the extended first oh, half. Oh, really? Oh, good, good. You were so impassioned. I, I was. It was right. It was righteous. And it, it, we, we will play clips that show exactly what I'm talking about. MSNBC hosts referring to what's happening at the border as an invasion. You know, uh, Democratic senators talking about the chaos that is taking place now, all essentially accepting Donald Trump's premise. And the difference between the situation between now and when the election happens will be only that Donald Trump's premise has now been adopted by the Democratic Party. The Democrats will not be able to get any um, policy changes associated with that. Except the only thing that's changed is that they now accept Donald Trump's premise that we are being subject to an invasion of immigrants at the at the border. And it's total chaos. And New York City is aflame right now. All of which is total BS. Total BS. Uh, but I, I will show you examples of this. It's a massive failure. Joe Biden's out there saying, like, they're afraid of, of Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump could just say, like, okay, I now have, I'm a, I'm a leader. And when I get in, they're going to do what I say, and we're going to fix this chaos that you agree is happening. I mean, it's this is chaos. Just, yeah. I, I can't even, I can't, I, don't get me started again on this. I know nobody did. A rip rose? Nobody did. <laughs> um, all right, but let's talk about the uh, Mayorkas impeachment, because this is pretty funny. Um, they got... A little bit hoodwinked, the Republicans did. And I'll explain in a moment, but this is what we saw yesterday uh, on the House floor. On this vote, the yeas are 214 and the nays are 216. The resolution is not adopted. Sort of feels like if you're going to hold an impeachment vote, you should be really sure that you're going to be able to impeach the guy. They're not doing a good job of whipping votes. I'll say that. Well, they had, there were three um, defectors. But here, we'll explain in a second. Here's Marjorie Taylor Greene's ex ex explanation. Was the plan? Like the Democrats hid one of these votes that they had, so it wasn't something that people would see. Is that something that Republicans? I'm I'm glad I'm glad you asked that because um, well we can basically look like look at this as a game unfortunately and their strategy and they hid one of their members uh, waiting to the last minute uh, watching to see our votes um, trying to throw us off on the numbers that we had versus the numbers wow. they had so yeah that was a strategy at play tonight. Fair. So do you essentially was the plan? Okay, so <laughs> to be clear, what she's talking about, she's actually sort of um she's she's sort of telling the truth here uh but it's also um like uh you're really bad at the yeah, basic game job? of counting yeah um so there were uh 212 democrats and four republicans who voted no the four republican votes well the first three that voted against it were ken buck uh tom mcclintock and mike gallagher and uh blake moore is the fourth vote and he's from utah now it was 215 to 215 at the end of voting and blake moore changed his vote so that he could vote against the impeachment thing because at 215 215 the impeachment motion dies and there's no opportunity to revive it unless someone on the Democratic side, or those three Republicans who actually genuinely voted no against it, wanted to revive it. So uh, Moore 
voted against it so that he has the opportunity to revive it in the future. Mm. You, this used to happen in the Senate quite a bit. You'd see like Harry Reid do this sometimes. Um, but here's what happened, and this is what uh, the Marjorie Taylor Greene is cr complaining about. Al Green apparently was in uh, the hospital. Democrat. And, uh, Democrat. Uh, he had uh, some type of uh, surgery. He um, he wanted to come back. He claims he didn't know uh, that he was going to be the tie-breaking voter in this. He wanted to vote against it. And uh, so he, he came in to the uh, house and they held him in like the green room until it was time for that specific vote. The Republicans had taken a vote earlier, which was sort of just a throwaway vote. I don't know what it was on, but some measure like, I don't know, naming a post office or whatever to, so that they could get a sense of like, okay, are we close to this? Right. Like what, how many people are, are here? here? Yep. And then Al Green, uh, I think they wheeled him in and he came in, he voted and then he left. I mean, they were hiding him, I guess. Well, first he was being hidden at the Hamas command center. I mean, the hospital where he was having surgery. And then the other <laughs> and then they wheeled him in, I guess they say in hospital clothes. I keep seeing like daily callers like really playing this up. He was in hospital clothes. He's not been photographed in hospital clothes. I think he was in his gown got changed, then came to the floor. And then now that's why there's that two vote threshold. But she it, like the reason she can't count in that instance is because even if Al Green hadn't showed up, that no vote still would have taken place, as you say. So they had the opportunity to revise it later. Right. No, no, no. Because if Al Green hadn't showed up, it wouldn't have been 215, 215. Oh, it would have been 215, okay. 214. OK. But when Al Green showed up, it was 215, 215. And then Blake Moore said, oh, I'm going to change my vote making it 216 against So he created the deadlock. Got it. Right. Yes, Aaron, Al yeah. Green created the deadlock. Okay. Exactly. And okay. the reason why, now, if you're if uh, you're uh, better at math than the Republicans, you will know that uh, 215 plus 250, or 216 plus 214 is uh, equals 430. And you say, well, well, I thought there was 435. George Santos, uh, as you recall, expelled. And they haven't uh, their His election is uh, next Tuesday, not his, but for that seat. Um, Kevin McCarthy resigned. The special election's not happening until May, uh, third week in May. Bill Johnson of Ohio resigned. Special election not until June. And uh, Brian Higgins, special election from New York, a special. He's a Democrat. Special election TBD. And then the uh, other person, Steve Scalise was not present because apparently he can't leave the hospital in mm. his gown. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know. He has cancer. He has cancer. I'm trying to. Um, just, just move on. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. He's like a, he's like David Duke without the baggage. I'm trying to try, you know, uh, do some type of, uh, he's like a, a, a different person with cancer, but with the baggage. That's the, that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Well, anyways, he didn't make it into the vote. Sahil Kapoor of uh, of CNN, uh, or sorry, NBC, um, said that he got a text from a Republican aide last night saying maybe we shouldn't have kicked out Santos. And Santos was gloating, <laughs> gloating all over social media. Was he on the House floor? <laughs> was he nearby or something like that? He's been showing up places like at the Trump victory party and and. He's very happy about this whole, uh, the, but like the fact that that's what they're, the, the conclusion that they're drawing is hilarious. It's your guys' fault. You didn't have the votes. And uh, we would also add the reason why uh, Steve Scalise cannot vote is because when the Republicans took over, they immediately rescinded the uh, proxy vote thing that uh, uh, was uh, there under the Democrats because of COVID. Yep. And <laughs> so, um, oops. That's whoopsie. why, whoopsie, that's why uh, they had to, you know, hide Al Green, a.k.a. he had to come in person despite having surgery to cast this vote. Um, the whole thing is hilarious. If you look at the whole uh, yesterday with that two thirds thing, too, uh, and the fact that they're going to end up passing, I think, the Ukraine Israel funding package. That's my guess. We'll see. You go back to everything that like the Matt Gates's and those crew did. Um, you realize like. All they did was uh, cluster F themselves in every way uh, possible. And I saw a tweet from another reporter last night. It might have been Jake Sherman. I don't remember. 
someone saying time to motion to vacate mike johnson which like i don't know if that's gonna happen it probably won't because the republicans were so badly scarred from how a, a debacle that was with kevin mccarthy but this is two failed votes back to back on the same night where mike johnson was unable to to de deliver and emmer as the whip was unable to actually count. effectively count where the Republican votes were at. It's embarrassing to have brought this to the floor and have it fail like this. Yeah, and aside from the embarrassment, what it really does is it just makes, um, it, 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 it hurts the Republican Party's chances in the fall. Um, and steps a little bit on their whole sort of like notion of like, there's chaos at the border. You, you don't vote for this thing and then the, the you know, but fortunately for them, I guess uh, Joe Biden's out there saying that there is chaos at the border and that uh, we are in being invaded practically. Right. And so um, the, the Democratic Party is doing their job for them. All right. Uh, in a moment, we'll be talking to Aaron Reed. In the meantime, a um, couple of words from our sponsors. I had uh, uh, this uh, product last night, in fact. Um, look into the refrigerator. What am I going to have uh, for dinner? What am I going to make for Saul? Am I going to have to order in again? God, no, please. There's one place he likes. That's it. Over and over and over again. And it's just because they think like it's a negotiation about getting a milkshake. I don't even want to talk about it. Um, but uh, I've got a solution for you. Um, in the past, we've talked about uh, HelloFresh um, having um, the, uh, oh wait, this is HelloFresh is not the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the pre-made one. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, HelloFresh has also uh, uh, pre-made stuff, well, which I tried. But I've also used uh, the uh, HelloFresh, uh, which is um, a service where they uh, send you ingredients for food and you make it. And um, this has also been uh, awesome. Uh, HelloFresh, uh, give it a try. Dig into their uh, biggest menu yet with over 45 recipes to choose from each week. I want to thank HelloFresh for supporting the Majority Report and uh, making my life easier, both when it comes to um, uh, making the meals, and they've got uh, like a pre-made one too. I mm. guess we're not talking about that. But uh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Majority Free. Use the code Majority Free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. Ditch the meal planning blues. And the grocery store run with quick, convenient recipes delivered right to you. The thing about the uh, HelloFresh that I love in terms of like the ingredients, the ingredients are incredibly fresh. The, 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 uh, the, the recipes are great, but they have ones you can choose that are 15 minutes. And easy, they have easy. ones that you can choose that are one pan. Wow. And uh, that means less cleanup and that means less time that I have to be there and I don't have to like, you know, I'm... I'm sorry. Like I tried it once, uh, but I'm not going to be like julienning uh, stuff. Like I'm going to chop a little bit and this and that, but I need things that are quick and um, healthy and taste good. Uh, so I can uh, feed my kid and uh, not feel, you know, feel like I'm feeding them good food, but also it's not going to take me a year. Um, HelloFresh handles all the meal planning, all the shopping, all you got to do, open your weekly box of fresh pre-proportioned ingredients, step-by-step -step recipes, and get cooking. And the other thing about that I love about HelloFresh is that they, the, the portion size is perfect. They have nailed it. They have nailed it. Um, we don't have uh, leftovers. We don't have any wasted food, which drives me nuts. Um, and it's uh, a full, I mean, they're great meals. Uh, they got farm fresh ingredients. Like I say, everything ri arrives pre-proportioned. Go to HelloFresh.com slash majority free and use the code majority free and they'll give you free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash majority free with code majority free. Also, uh, another one of my favorite uh, uh, sponsors. Um Back in the day, we used to uh, um, have a, a sponsor that was uh, like a subscription service. And I'm like, well, I got a beard now. I don't want to do this. It's a bit of a waste. And um, and then uh, these guys came and it was like a revelation. I'm talking about Henson shaving. Um, if you uh, 
if you have never shaved with a straight edge razor before, you're in for a a real awakening. And even more so with these guys. Um, Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer. They made parts for like the uh, International Space Station and the Mars Rover. Uh, and they have brought their precision engineering to your razor. In addition to these channels that they have right here so that you can evacuate your thing without like smashing your mm -hmm. uh, thing on uh, thing or using your thumb, God forbid. Um, the beauty of these razors are is that it turns out a close, clean shave without nicks and cuts, without irritation, comes from not the, sh the, the uh, sharpness of the blade because that's apparently easily doable. It comes from the length of the blade from the razor itself, because it's sort of like a diving board. And because these guys use those uh, uh, com computer numerical something machines, I can never remember what they're called, <laughs> but they're computerized. 0. 0.0013 inches. The blade hangs out from here. And less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade, and it means an amazing shave. Um, and the thing about Henson shaving, and I think honestly, they're Canadian company. It's the only way that this happens right. because uh, uh, Americans just don't think this way anymore. Sadly, they want it to be the best razor, not the best razor business. And what do I mean by that? You buy this razor, you buy it once. It's nice. It feels heavy and they got a bunch of different colors and they got a couple of different variants of this. You buy it once. And then for the rest of your life, it will never cost you more than 3 to $5 a year to shave. 3 to $5 a year. Now me, I'm using like one blade like every two months because all I do is here and right. here. But um, for your average person, 3 to 5 bucks a year. And the beauty of it is that they'll also now give you uh, like a two-year supply of, of razor blades because it uses the non-proprietary uh, dual edge, uh, razor blades. So it's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensionshaving.com slash majority. Pick the razor for you. Use the code majority. You're going to get two years worth of blades free with your razor, but you need to put them into your cart. They won't do it for you. You put the, you choose them and then they'll be free in the cart. That's a, uh, 100 free blades. When you head to Henson shaving, H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G, HensonShaving.com slash majority. Use the code majority. We will put the links. These are also great gifts. This will be a great uh, Valentine's uh, present, frankly. Mm. Um, uh, we'll put the uh, codes in the um, uh, podcast and YouTube description and on the majority.fm. All right, quick break. When we come back, uh, Aaron Reed on um, the uh, anti-trans legislation that is still sort of uh, uh, burning up the uh, legislatures across the country. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Joining us now, Aaron Reed, independent journalist, author of the Aaron in the Morning newsletter on Substack. Uh, Aaron, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me on again. Um, so uh, 2024, uh, been a busy year for uh, the anti-trans uh, movement in, in some of these legislatures across the country. Um I don't know where we should start. Let's start, I guess, with, um, let, let's start from, I guess, the most recent back. But um, I want to, like, there was a piece in the New York Times, not about legislation, but it has been shocking for some, I guess, maybe not so much for others. The the insistence on, on the New York Times sort of like <clears throat> on this sort of uh, anti-trans beat for now, what feels like a couple of years. Uh, but what's the latest uh, that uh, we have? It was a um, an article by Pamela Paul. 
Yeah, so the New York Times published a 4,500 word opinion piece by Pamela Paul. It ended up being printed into two full pages of New York Times print, probably one of the longest opinion pieces that they've ever published, and it read like a straight news piece. However, um, you could clearly tell whenever you, at least any journalist who covers this on a regular basis, could clearly tell that it was indeed an opinion piece and not a fact-checked piece because many of the citations did not back up her arguments. Um, this led to the piece getting widely disseminated and within hours actually it was uh, I was lucky enough to have caught the piece immediately after it was published I wrote a response a sort of um, overlooking of some of the claims in the piece and managed to get it out within a couple of hours that piece has since then um, been circulated among academic list serves and uh, major places where this issue is is analyzed. The piece had tons of misinformation. It had things like an 80% detransition rate or desistance rate, where we just got the national survey of the U.S. transgender survey today that states that only 3% of trans people regret their transitions. And so it was a bunch of things like that. There were retracted how, studies How does in there. the New York Times publish anything, even if it's an opinion piece, that states a fact that there's 80% detransition rate when it's 3%? You know, I don't know. And and I think that this is this is a major problem with the Times. This has been something that the Times has been called out on before, and it's getting worse. And, and you know, I will say, as a trans journalist, I have submitted pieces to the Times multiple times. I've never gotten accepted there. I'm one of the top journalists in this field whenever it comes to writing on this issue. And so it should say something about which voices they choose to platform. Um, I'm working on a response to Pamela Paul, a, a broader one since she has directly addressed another article directly at me and my and one of my colleagues, Evan Urquhart, uh, on this issue. And so I don't know what it, what it will take to change the culture at the New York Times, but they are content to print out things that are not backed by fact. But, but where does that 80% figure come from? Can you just explain what that distortion oh, of represents? Course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people will hear this. I've, I've heard this in legislatures. This is sometimes gets brought up in Republican legislatures where they're going to ban care for any age or something like that. And the 80% figure actually comes from a 1996 Ken Zucker book. And Ken Zucker was a um, therapist up in Canada. His clinic was actually closed after investigations of conversion therapy. Uh, and in specific, the old way of diagnosing gender identity disorder had nothing to do with being trans. Instead, you would take your feminine young boy or masculine tom, tom girl, and you brought them in and you said they're not acting masculine enough or they're not acting feminine enough. And Zucker would then go to try to get them to act, act more feminine or masculine. And so that is where this 80% number comes from. These people were not actually trans. And, and the standards have actually shifted since then. Now it is required for you to specifically want to be another sex or to be identify as another gender. Those standards were not in place back then. Back then they considered so, feminine gay men disordered, for instance. So, yeah. so if I understand you correctly, he was measuring implied like, like he was basically implying or inferring that they wanted that they were trans and then yeah. was able to stop them from the inference that he was making. Exactly right. And not only that, but it was an active attempt to stop them that resulted in that number. And so we're talking about aversion therapy. We're talking about conversion therapy. We're talking about reparative therapy, uh, which is what a report, an independent report on his practices stated. Um, uh, it's incredible to use those statistics when you see, like, I mean, you say that 3% figure, I've, uh, there, there are other much broader clinical studies from very recently that are all single digit numbers when it comes to desistance rates. And, and I actually want to bring your listeners and viewers to think about this logically. If 80% of trans people detransitioned or desisted or don't identify as trans anymore, you would see far more detransitioners than trans people. Like, five times as many. That's just not the case. I mean, it, it, it's a problem whenever Florida can't find a single detransitioner to defend their law in court. The, it was cited that they couldn't find one that would stand in favor of the law. There's a there's a real uh, quality to this. I remember for a long time, uh, the, um, uh, the right was talking about the estate tax and how many family farms ha had to be had to be uh, uh, sold because of the, the uh, uh, so-called death tax, they would call it. And when it came time to actually find these people, there were none. Uh, you know, there was maybe one or two, but this, uh, it's amazing how much the, the sort of zombie finger uh, figures uh, will, 
we'll continue. All right. Well, let's let's move to sort of like you know, sort of I guess the um, the um, the 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 product that is generated <clears throat> by these type of lies. Um, you just wrote a piece yesterday uh, in Indiana. Apparently, the um, the the attorney general launched a tool for parents to report gender ideology in schools. It doesn't seem like it's going very well for them right now. No. And you would think that he would have learned from the previous two times such report forms or snitch forms were introduced into the general public. You see, for Todd Rokita, he launched this form and he's not going to find many responses. We found, for instance, in Virginia, barely anybody submitted responses and in Missouri, it shut down as well. But what he is going to get is large numbers of people reporting the Bible for teenage pregnancy. He's going to get large numbers of people submitting movie scripts. And that's what we saw. Um, we, we saw people who were very upset with the sort of um, observ observer slash um, um, sort of snitch form, if you will. And they said that, okay, we're going to start reporting just junk garbage memes because we don't want this. We don't want people to be telling on our teachers. We don't want people to be telling on our students, telling on our peers. Apparently, they uh, a lot of people sent the picture of Trump with Rudy Giuliani and drag and Indiana. They Jones, did. That was one of them. Indiana Jones slapping a Nazi, which is rude. Yes. Yep. And there was and, a Godzilla with a trans flag that got okay. sent as well. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, so can and and um, can people do that around the country? I mean, just uh, if they see something uh, they want to send to uh, the Indiana. You know, there Attorney is Gen there is a there is a link to uh, report things to the Indiana Attorney General if you see so fit to mm. report something that you are concerned about. Uh, that link is on my website. All right. Well, fantastic. I mean, I think uh, people should get on that right well. away. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the, the other sort of like a, a thing that we're seeing now, I mean, it really, the, the way that this has evolved, it, 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 it it's sort of, it, it's fascinating to me because I will say this, and I think I mentioned to this uh, uh, to you in the past, but um, in the wake of the 2022 election, particularly how poorly uh, things went for the Republicans in Michigan, where they dumped about $50 million into a, a various sort of anti-trans messaging as a way of an election strategy, and they got, they got obliterated in Michigan. Um, my uh, a, a assumption at that time was like, okay, this is they're done. There's no more efficacy for them in this. And, and, and certainly there's a sense like within the, uh, national Republican media enterprise, it's not as sort of lucrative for them as it was, but it's still happening in these States because you get these, these right-wing politicians and their constituency are amenable and want this stuff. And so we're still seeing this, th these, this legislation continue. Yes. Yes. And I think that this is because once you fan the flames of moral panic, it's hard to put those fires out and these fires still burn in places where we have majority Republican legislatures uh, in Missouri, for instance, I was covering a hearing just last week where, you know, they had nine anti-trans bills heard in a single day. It was by far the most common kind of bill that they were hearing the most time dedicated to this issue. And Missouri Representative Mann said in that hearing, he said that I am a student of history. I know where this ends. You'll never be satisfied. You'll always be coming back for more. And I think that that's the best explanation for what's going on. I mean, we saw 73% of Moms for Liberty candidates lose their races in this last election. They ran on trans issues. We saw Virginia got swept by Democrats who ran against anti-trans policies. We saw people swear in on banned books in school board races in Loudoun County and Bucks County. And so th this is they, they've lost their rational compass on this issue. And instead, they've just turned into this massive moral panic. And, and it, it's going to be like, it's going to, it feels like it's going to get even more extreme in the reddest of areas uh, and um, create sort of, uh, I mean, th it's going to become that much more of an outlier, it feels like. Yes. Um, and in fact, and in fact, just yesterday we saw in Iowa, um, the governor, Kim Reynolds, submitted a bill that would and all legal recognition for trans people and require trans people to have special markers on their birth certificates that identify them as trans. And in this bill, 
it actually redefines their birth certificates or on their uh, licenses. It was going to be on their birth certificates and driver's licenses. Right now, it's only on birth certificates. They've amended out the driver's license portion, but they have kept the birth certificate portion. Meaning um, amending someone's birth certificate uh, with a little special marker. With a, with a marker that identifies them as trans. It'll have like both gender markers on there. It's it's something that, you know, a lot of people compared to the sort of pink triangle laws back in uh, the 1940s where LGBTQ people were forced to identify themselves. I need to I need people to be to 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 sit with this for one second that this legislation forces a like a basically a scarlet letter of transness onto a birth certificate to amend someone's birth certificate so that employers potentially if you're giving documentation or if you're giving it to a bank they get to say they get to determine like be like oh I I know what your genitals are that is the purpose of this legislation and that is I mean, it sh shouldn't be astounding to me, but like that—that that is very disturbing in, in in what it's trying to do. Absolutely, and not only that, there's another aspect of this legislation that didn't get much coverage until yesterday, and that the legislation actually redefines the word equal. It says that equal no longer means same or identical when it comes to trans people, and then it goes on to say separate does not always imply uh, equality. So uh, if I understand what you're saying is that this is their um, they're changing the definition of what essentially discrimination would be uh, to say that you can do these things based upon this information that you glean from the uh, the birth certificate. What what ostensibly is the purpose? Like when they when when there when when there is a, a rationale uh, that if if I'm a trans person, I'm in Iowa, I got to go back and uh change my birth certificate to reflect this new sort of like um uh this new i guess you know marker as it were what is their rationale for why this needs to happen like what That's is the, the problem question. that ostensibly they're trying to fix absolutely and that question was directly posed to the representative and one of the representatives who was sponsoring the bill stated that well it's your birth record and we need to have an accurate record of that but then whenever you look into Adoption, for instance, we allow people to go back and change their birth certificates whenever it comes to adoption. So that rationale does not hold up whenever it comes to trans people. They don't have a rationale for it, not one that makes sense. So for instance, when asked about changing the word equal, the person was asked, what does the word equal even mean now? And she responded, equal would mean, I would assume it would mean, um, I don't know exactly what it means in this context. That is specifically what she said. Where are they getting these ideas from? Like, is this an, like an ALEC type of situation or is there some sort of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, more um, a conservative cultural uh, version of ALEC these days? Of course. So the Alliance Spending Freedom and Heritage Foundation are the two major players right now. We know that the Heritage Foundation released a report called Project 2025, where they intend to make transgender and LGBTQ people obscene uh, and apply obscenity laws towards them, as well as, um, you know, ban LGBTQ people online as pornographic and uh, a number of other things, uh, visions for the future of America, such as making the presidency absolute in power. And so th this is what they are trying to do with these laws. This model legislation gets shotgunned everywhere. It was called out in Iowa for being from outside of Iowa. And in fact, 300 people showed up against the bill. Only three or four showed up in favor. Amazing. It's amazing, though. Like the, 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 the durability of this as a, as a issue within these groups, despite the fact that it is, there doesn't seem to be a significant constituency that is actually genuinely uh, interested in it. Um, I mean, I get like, you know, I, I think for a while it was, it was probably uh, providing some clicks for, uh, you know, some podcasters, uh, you know, across uh, the spectrums. Uh, but it, it, in terms of like just real people, I think mostly people are just sort of baffled by this. I mean, you, you had a piece, uh, I guess it was a week ago. Um, there was a audio from a, like a Twitter, um, Twitter, whatever they do on uh, spaces. The, the spaces type of thing. And where Michigan Republicans along with Ohio Republicans, uh, said their end game is to ban trans care for everyone. And it's like, as a Michigan Republican, Aren't you like, well, hey guys, maybe we should work on something else. And, but no, it, it's, it's fascinating to me. 
Absolutely. And this is Representative Gary Click out of Ohio, the person who wrote the anti-trans ban in Ohio that was vetoed by Governor DeWine. It blew up into national news whenever DeWine vetoed it. He had a meeting with a bunch of Michigan Republicans where they stated that the end game, and that's this is the words that they used, the end game is to ban this for everyone. Whereupon Representative Click came back and said, yeah, but you got to do it in small bits and incrementally. That way we can get there. And so they're, they're talking about this openly. They're talking about what they want to do openly and they don't intend to stop regardless of how popular it is because at this point they've got the, they've got the dollars, the, the advertising dollars from the Alliance Defending Freedom and the Heritage Foundation. They've got the lobbyist money. They've got you know, the very far Christian right that has attempted to take hold of the country through the extreme wing of the Republican party. Um, uh, let's just uh, end uh, with, with, with Florida. Um, there's there's two stories coming out of Florida in the past couple of weeks. Um, one is that the uh, that the Florida Democratic Congressional Caucus has uh, appealed to uh, President Biden to essentially uh, block the uh, license ban for trans people in Florida with uh, the Real ID Act. Explain to us what that means. Yes, of course. Um, so in Florida, the DMV there, the Florida Department of Motor Vehicles there, stated that any trans person with a gender identity that did not, not match their assigned sex at birth could be found guilty of fraud, have their license revoked, and even potentially face criminal penalties. This is resulting in all DMVs refusing to change gender markers for trans people and people with changed gender markers wondering if they're going to become criminally liable. And so every single Democratic representative to Congress, this is the first time, it's very significant, the first time that this has occurred, signed a letter to the Biden administration urging it to use the powers that it has to reverse this law. The um, 2005 law, the Real ID Act, was actually passed by Republicans, and it states that gender, not sex, gender must be on driver's licenses. And so the fact that this particular bill doesn't do that, the fact that this provision in Florida bans that and could charge people, this is something that the administration could conceivably do to, to perhaps fix this issue for Floridians. And would this be the, the DOJ would step in or, or how would it work? So there are a number of ways that this could be done. It could be done through a slower process known as rule change, or it could be done by stating that Florida is now out of compliance. Um, it, it may be the DOJ. It may be another one of the administration um, administration departments. But there is a way, a mechanism by which the state can be considered out of compliance with the Real ID Act. Um. There's also now a bill in Florida that would force health insurance plans. Um, I mean, just the idea that 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 Republicans are, are forcing health insurance plans to cover anything is yeah. sort of interesting. But it becomes more clear uh, when I finish the sentence to cover conversion therapy, which has been outlawed in I don't know how many states at this point. Um, I still have on my soundboard uh, a clip of uh, one of the most famous uh, conversion therapists um, who would take his tennis racket and smack his uh, couch um, as if it was his mother. Um, but uh, w w what are the prospects for that bill? Very high. It's likely going to pass. This, is, this bill is actually the same bill that bans driver's licenses legislatively. So this administrative rule that's going on in Florida has made the driver's license ban work until they can pass this law. And the law is what's moving forward. But yes, it requires health insurance to cover conversion therapy outright. The, the representative was asked about that. And usually they try to couch it as, oh, no, it's not actually conversion therapy. It's exploratory therapy. No, this representative specifically said, yes, it allows for parents to choose that option if they see fit. Um, well, uh, Aaron, really appreciate the work you do, uh, over at, uh, Aaron in the morning and people can go and, and, and check out, uh, this uh, one other question that I, that I feel like I, I saw this in a tweet some time back, but, um, there was a lot of talk about, uh, the idea that like the, 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 the idea of, of an increase of people who are, um, uh, coming out as trans was some type of like uh, social media contagion or, or or some other type of like social contagion um and the the counter argument to that is of course that um it's not our society has become more accepting and it's the right people hand don't need or to left say left handedness graph the left handedness graph yeah. um but the um the rate of uh, of of people uh, who are coming out as trans seems to be sort of flattening at this point. Is that right? 
It does. It does. And in fact, this came from a recent Swedish study that shows that the rate does seem to be flattening. And we are probably getting to the real prevalence of transgender people in society, which has been estimated to be between one and two percent. Uh, up until this point, many people simply have not been able to express their gender identity or their ability to be trans. I knew that I was trans in the 1990s. I explicitly identified online as trans, but I was not able to actually come out in public at that time. And so things have gotten better. I'm living proof of that. And I think many people who have come out in the last five years or so can also attest to that. It, 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 when you think about the percentage of, of legislation, that uh, of, of laws that have been introduced in the past two or three years uh, regarding trans people, if people are looking for a social contagion, I think that's the first place they should start, yep. Yep. frankly. Um, and, I mean, it, 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 anything that's out of balance uh, on that level is really, it's, it, it's shocking to me. But uh, again, appreciate the work and thank you so much for coming on. We'll put a link uh, to your Substack at uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to uh, Margie Mason and Robin McDowell, investigative reporters for the Associated Press, who have done a two-year investigation into the use of prison labor some of the biggest brands that you uh, use in your daily life. We'll be right back. back sam cedar emma vigland on the majority report uh, joining us now margie mason uh and robin mcdowell investigative reporters for the associated press who have just come out with a um really a a massive uh piece of reporting uh and congratulations to both of you uh that has been uh, you've been working on for at least two years i guess um that uh basically follows the work of prisoners and um, where the end products of that work uh, um, uh, ends up. Uh, Robin, let's start with you. Uh, give us a sense of like where, uh, in the course of your reporting, where were the places that you guys looked for the, for the where this labor was taking place? Okay. Um, we really looked all over the country. We put out public records requests in all 50 states or spoke to public information officials. Um, and then we also went to numerous states. But I would say really the focus in terms of the hard labor or the things that were really kind of the most brutal conditions were largely in the South. And, uh, and Margie, give us a sense of like what these working conditions are. I mean, I think because people, <clears throat> I think are have a broad sense that oh sure yeah prisoners work maybe they go and they work in the mess hall or they do the physical plant of the uh of the of the building and that conceivably there are like work programs but that's not what we're talking about here well i think there's different types of work that's certainly one type of work and it's a major part of the work that incarcerated people are tasked with doing so you know they could be doing the laundry they could be working in the kitchen um, mopping the floors and, and, you know, 
those jobs are generally not paying very much money. Most jobs aren't paying very much money, just a few cents or maybe nothing at all. Um, we also looked at jobs that were on specifically tied to agriculture and on prison farms. And I think this is the thing where most people probably don't even realize that these farms still exist in some places. Um, we found, uh, you know, people working on these farms. Again, you could be in a state uh, where you are sentenced to hard labor and you are forced to work and you can be punished if you're not if you do, if you refuse to work. So that means that you could be sent to solitary confinement or you could face um, privileges being pulled from you or maybe you would lose a chance at your parole. Um, and yes, we found uh, that, you know, in some states, uh, there are people working in the fields. Um, these are on farms that were former slave plantations. Um, and I think that was a surprise to us and I think to a lot of readers as well. Well, you, you highlight, I mentioned this to you in the break, but that, uh, you know, my, my sister did some work highlighting Angola, and that's a huge feature of your of your piece. A this People may not have a sense who are in the Northeast or in the West of like this, these sprawling uh, prison complexes where it's really there to to get to, to force these uh, prisoners into these really, really low wage uh, uh, jobs, essentially, while they're in prison. Um, and in Angola in particular, it's also performing for people in the neighborhood uh, when they, they do this kind of rodeo thing, which is quite dehumanizing. But like, I mean, can you give people a sense of the scale of these facilities, places like Angola, places in the South, and how many prisoners are actually doing work for corporations? Any well, I can, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I'll just go scoop back a little bit and just point out or kind of build a little bit on what Margie was saying about the industry of prison labor and really how big it is. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. We chose to focus on agriculture, which is really just a sliver of that because it shows kind of a through line of how did we get here from slavery to the convict leasing period to laws that have passed over the years, making it easier and easier to send goods across state lines. So, so that's really um, a lot of this investigation was kind of putting it in that historical context. We were really interested in the plantations um, or penal farms in the South because that's where you really see that through line most clearly. Angola is vast. It's 18,000 acres. Um, it was a former slave plantation um, owned for a period by one of the biggest slave traders in the United States. Um, and then after slavery ended and they passed the um, 13th Amendment, um, allowing people to continue working if they had been convicted of crime, you started seeing people being rounded up in, in Louisiana as well and put to work on the same plantation um, after slavery ended. So <clears throat> that's something we're still seeing and over, you know, like one of the most remarkable things for us is, was looking at photographs from just a few years ago and comparing it over time and just seeing how similar it was. Um, uh, but Angola was. Robin, uh, you, you said uh, you, you guys focused on the agricultural part of this, uh, implying that there's whole other sort of like, uh, I guess, silos, if you will, or verticals of other industries. Um, uh, and I and I understand you didn't do the reporting uh, uh, in those areas, but do you have a sense of like what we're talking about? And if we're talking billions of dollars in the context of agriculture, what are we talking about? What other industries are we talking about? And uh, and then I, I want to go to uh, Margie about the sort of like the nature of the work, but uh, or the safety, you know, the the standards, I should say. But but do you have a sense of like what the other industries are and what we're talking about in terms of dollars? Well, I think the biggest chunk, like Marjorie was saying, is really maintaining the facilities. So the laundry kitchen, swamping, those those sort of things. But then there are also other businesses that you think of when you think of prison labor as Americans, usually license plates, making license plates or building office furniture or military uniforms um, or solar panels. It, it goes on and on. But they're not going out... Um well, I guess building solar panels, but they're, are they going into factories? Are they, are they producing uh, components of, I don't know, vehicles? Or are they uh, components of, of uh, machinery? Or are they, I don't know, uh, you know, chopping well, uh, trees down? Are they uh, mining for stuff? 
It really depends on the facility and the program. Um, but if you're working inside a prison, say with the license plates, they're actually putting the film on the license plates and making them in the prison. You can also be leased out in certain places to companies to kind of work on the grounds there, um, as, as we found in Arizona with the Hickman's egg farm. So it, it really depends also. There's, there's at this point so many different types of prison labor, um, including prison industries programs, which work with joint partners to kind of make, to have a, um, a formal agreement with the corrections industry, in which they can't, in which case they can leave the facility or sometimes it's the work release center. Um, it just depends on the, the state really. And can you talk a bit about the wages and how that, those contracts with those prisons, it helps depress them to this incredibly low level so they can have things to buy at the, the commissary or make a phone call or send an email, but the amount of work that, that many of these prisoners have to do to get <laughs> to that threshold. Uh, maybe Margie, you can take that one. Yeah, I mean, I think that again, um, if they're just doing kind of the maintenance work, they're making, you know, oftentimes just pennies an hour. And so, yes, it's, you know, they're having to buy things from the commissary. They're having to buy things like deodorant, soap. I know we talked with women and they were saying that, you know, they would get feminine hygiene product, products um, once a month or whatever, but it was never enough. Um, toilet paper even. Uh, but then you have, you know, a lot of people that we talked to, they were happy to have these outside jobs. And, and let us stress that these outside jobs, they pay more, um, but there are a few of them. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a much smaller percentage of the work. Um, and so with those jobs, what you have is you have them going out and oftentimes working, Robin mentioned Hickman's egg farm out in um, Arizona. They've been working out there for 30 years and they get paid more. But what ends up happening is the state comes in and they they take like the, um, you know, right off the top of their wages, they'll take uh, like the correctional industries will take a chunk. And then the, the actual state comes in, the prison comes in and takes 30% for room and board. And they also get charged, you know, a, a fee for like things like electricity. And what we found in this particular case with Hickman's, it was really interesting, is that during the pandemic, um, we think it was unprecedented. They actually moved um, uh, like 140 women from the prison to um, the farm. They put them in a, in a barn-like structure, it was a big like dormitory type structure and housed them there for you know over a year so that they could continue working during the pandemic and even while they were still living off-site away from the prison um the state was still garnishing 30 percent of their wages for room and board um let's let's just talk uh, margie a little bit about the 13th amendment um the 13th amendment was in many ways a way of like making sure that we had a labor force uh, in the wake of, of saying that we don't uh, allow for slavery. And in fact, there was a, um, a big jump in the number of formerly freed slaves uh, that uh, we imprisoned as a country within just within years. Um, and and, and Matt, a significant portion of that uh, sort of free labor uh, that was gone with the uh, abolishment of slavery ended up being replenished with free labor from uh, convicts. And like you say, it, uh, it, it didn't, it still doesn't look that different uh, in some of those places like Angola for that matter. Um, but what of like, what obligations and the 13th amendment, just to remind people says you can basically be a slave if you're in prison. Um, and uh, it's the only circumstance where you can basically uh, be enslaved um, in terms of work. But is there any provision for worker standards for these people? Like, uh, I mean, uh, small, you know, I mean, it's, I guess, you know, it's, it's a subsidiary question to whether you should be forced to work at that point. But are there any standards whatsoever? And, and if so, where do they come through from? Well, I think this is a really interesting thing. Um, and one of the things that we, we wanted to do with this story was really kind of take people back on a journey through history in a way, because I think that we learned a lot in this reporting. Um, the 13th Amendment after the Civil War abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, but there is a clause in there and it says, except if you're convicted of a crime. And some people refer to this as the punishment clause. 
And so then what happened um, is that after um, emancipation in, in the South, especially where it was, you know, the economy was shattered and they were trying to, to rebuild, um, they started rounding up mostly young black men and imprisoning them for very minor things like uh, loitering or vagrancy or very, very minor crimes. And they were sending them off to work. They were, they were leasing them out to, um, you know, coal mines, railroads, these big industries. Um, and they were working them and beating them. And uh, oftentimes they, the, the death rate was quite high. And so that was the convict leasing era. And that really was kind of the, the, the foundation for prison labor that we built upon to today. Um, and then to answer your question about the standards, uh, it's, it's interesting because what we found was that, you know, in some states, it's actually spelled out in the statute that if you are incarcerated and you're a worker, um, you are not an employee. And as such, you are not entitled to the same um, benefits or rights or protections that other American workers receive. So in some cases, what we found was even if you're standing and working side by side with somebody else um, who's who's a, you know, quote unquote, free worker, um, you know, you might if you get hurt as an incarcerated worker, you might not be entitled to things like, say, workers compensation or disability benefits or um, it's very hard in many instances for incarcerated workers to sue the wrongful death, let's just say. So there's a it's it's almost like there's a gray area that you're in. And so, you know, we've asked the question, well, what happens if you get really seriously injured or if you're killed on the job? You know, what happens if, say, you lose a limb and then you get out of prison um, and then you you find it difficult to work, but you're not entitled again to the same benefits as as other workers. Um, lastly, Robin, um, what what are the companies that you uh, essentially made aware that um, like how much a, a lot of them seem to say like oh well we we have a policy against that we don't do that um, we used to do that we don't do that anymore I um, mean you guys literally followed in some instances trucks full of cattle to where they were going they were sold then at auction and they end up in this one place like there is a quality to this of like oh well that's our subcontractor subcontractor mm -hmm. so we know that's not us but what has there been any movement is there any like is there any response to this in in any in in in, in legislatures or at the corporate level well i think it really depends on what companies you're talking about you have some companies big um you know uh commodity traders for instance that are buying directly from the prisons and they're very aware of that um cargill for instance said that they did have legacy purchases and they were going to review that now and 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 look at possible remedial actions um but a lot of the companies when we reached out to them originally had not seen the story. We told them basically what our findings were and our sense really now is they're kind of knocking heads and trying to figure out, well, what do we do? Technically it's legal, um, but but there also is kind of a, a climate in the country now that, that re-examines some of our, our policies. Um, and and might, not ha might not agree with, with companies that say, okay, um, we're not doing anything wrong here. Well, hopefully uh, your piece uh, gets widely uh, read. Uh, Margie Mason, Robin McDowell, investigative reporters for the Associated Press. The uh, piece is prisoners in the U.S. are part of a hidden workforce linked to hundreds of popular food brands. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm and in the podcast and YouTube description. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, all right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break. Um, and, uh, head into the, uh, fun half. Uh, we, we don't have time for, uh, we, you know, uh, for, uh, our, our, our normal, uh, salutations. Hopefully it's not the frosty half. Uh, and yeah, I mean, people need to prep for this. Uh, we'll do, we'll do an abbreviated fun half, uh, song, and then, uh, we'll be talking to, um, uh, what's his, uh, Tim Heidecker, uh, who is of the office hours live show. Hmm. Uh, and about, uh, some of his journalism that he's been doing on Tim pool. And, uh, you know, uh, he's been digging deep in the bowels of, uh, Tim pool's background. 
to uh, to look at what's been going on. And uh, we will talk to him then. And uh, we'll be right back. What's that? Yeah, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah, as if this is the fun half. Uh, fun half. So run the fun half for like half of the song. Okay. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? <laughs> Alpha males are back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! No, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back nightmare. DJ nightmare. Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Dan. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See why people do drugs? They look. We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland. Fun half of the majority report. Uh, joining us now, uh, Tim Heidecker. From the uh, office, um, office hours live show, um, and <laughs> I'm matching. Sorry, I get, I are, get we cl- are we clash? Are we clashing or matching today, Sam? Well, we did. Uh, I guess we are. We're a little bit clashing. That's okay. You're matching, um, but now, the clashing will come later once you guys hash out all of your differences. I just want to uh, start off uh, by saying that I know uh, that uh, Tim, you and I have had somewhat of a contentious history in the past. Um, and for a long time, I just it, tried to ignore you, um, and everything that you were putting out. Um, and I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't like to get caught up in those type of like petty little, uh, things. Um, and you know, a lot of people write in, they're like, oh, office hours live. That's very similar to break room live, which you did, uh, 10, 12 years ago. And I, <laughs> like, I ignore that type of thing. It's not that type of stuff. What is a not, preamble. It's just it's not that important to me. But what is important to me is good journalism. And uh, we, do we have a clip of this? We just want to show uh, what you did and, and how uh, impressive this was. Uh, I mean, it's almost no, like they a, don't have any. It's a forensic. They don't have anything ready. No, we, oh, we have it. We, 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 have, have, we have it. it. Let's, it, let's pop it up. This is, uh, this is. Uh, the way you're able to enhance the audio in the room, it's, it's like a te- technological journalistic oh, achievement. Right. Yeah, yeah, let's pop this up uh, and uh, just uh, show, remind people what. This Timcast broadcast while he was talking to uh, Don, Donald Trump Jr. Well, let's take a look and see what happened and we can uh, discuss what we think might have happened here. Since the last time. Before that yeah. question, I'm going to do something I've never done on the show before. I'm going to leave. I'm actually feeling really, really sick, but we've got some awesome friends. I don't know if uh, Phil or Josie or, or somebody wants to jump in, take my seat. Uh, Why don't you guys both come up for a minute? Uh, I'm feeling real sick. I'm really? Bathroom. Yeah. I'm sorry. Wait, to, wait, uh, back to the second. Yeah, look at <laughs> Okay. Now, um, that was, um, I mean, I'm interested in like, how your team like uh, found that. I mean, because it really, well, uh, go ahead. I'll tell it's, you, I... I am a fan of the show of his, I watch the show. I don't think I watch it every day, but there's a thing. First of all, YouTube is, is got me, got me algorithmically trapped in the Tim pool universe. Um, and somehow on the West coast, it hits at a certain hour when I happen to find myself kind of, you know, after dinner, I go in my room and I just want to chill out, look at some stuff on the internet and there it is. It's live. Tim cast is happening. And I often pop in. I like, the, I, I mean, they're, depl- they're, I was going to say deplorable. I guess I could say depl- <laughs> they're terrible people, but they're kind of fascinating to watch. Do you find that? Does, does, I mean, you guys get caught up watching them all the time. It's a great show. Yeah, I mean, look, Tim, I, I've been to the, the belly of the beast there. I've been to the, uh, the skate park. It's a it's the compound. A, the compound. They all, you know, live and work together seemingly, you know. It's, yeah. it's in West Virginia. Um I want to know so much about that. Uh I like, could tell so they, you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Do, do they, they all live at the compound? Because it's unclear who are, to who me. Who are these other people? I. But there's like a did, lot. Did they move there to yeah. be a part of the show? I walked through the bottom of the basement. There's pinball machines uh, and there's games. Um, you know, like if like a teenager kind of imagined what a house would look like for them sure. and all their friends. There's a whole wall of of uh, signed caricatures of people like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Steve Bannon. Fine. And then the studio is lit like a grocery aisle. And right. behind and the bathroom is behind a secret trap door um, that is very heavy and it's hard to open. And that's probably where, you know, your team was able to enhance the audio so effectively for that <laughs> video. You probably got the echoes from that from that safe room. Uh, oh, that toilet. I believe was them in Iowa. Not oh, to um, well. get too picky with you, but yeah, I'm see, sorry. this is what uh, the kind of journalism that I think is what um, I'm willing to overlook a lot of the other stuff about Tim. Exactly. Uh, to have him on to talk about. Um, I mean, there there was Tim with Don Jr. himself. That was a, I don't know if it, if you could capture that in the clip, but yes, Tim was talking with Don Jr. and what a get i mean how exciting one generation away from the man himself and he couldn't hold it together he couldn't have i think if i was in that position i would have just squeezed it. you know i just push through it or just sit through it Take i mean break. like let it happen let it happen <laughs> and just pretend you know play it off a little bit uh, or go, you know what? We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in a few and then go relieve yourself. What do you clean think? Up. I mean, Tim, because obviously you spent a lot of time studying this. What do you think was going on? I mean, do you think this was like, um, do you think this is, was it nerves that uh, Tim Pool was going through? Do you think, I mean, you're, uh, you know, you, yeah, you've, I've thought uh, about you're this. a performer and uh, I think, uh, and and I don't know if you're a doctor per se, but I'm sure that uh, at various times you've worn like a doctor's smock. What is sure. your sense of what was going on biologically there? Well, from what I understand from people, from what I've heard uh, and what people have been saying is that he's um, not taking good care of himself hygienically. Um, I see. And, and that I mean, leaves you, but you be, I, I don't know. I mean, this is just what people are saying. This is what I've heard. This is what I'm asking to reveal his um, sources. It's bad, bad form. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't, uh, there's people that are too close that are close to that situation. I think would be put in jeopardy if they were revealed, if those sources were revealed, but um, you know, with there, these guys, uh, there's a history of, um, you know, anti-vax, anti-mask, perspective and i think that's starting to affect their general hygiene and their general cleanliness and sort of a repudiation of germ uh you know germ theory if you will the, the idea oh, of of course shall we say i don't want to say that he's not washing his hands but i mean that's what it sounds like yeah i mean that's what it sounds like and, and, and then you become susceptible susceptible to bacteria you become susceptible to all kinds of diseases and we may be seeing the beginnings of a bigger, I don't know. Like I said, I, I'm not a doctor. I have played doctors in, in various sketches. Right. But you, 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 you kind of draw some conclusions I think are fair to draw that things are going to get a lot worse. I mean, uh, particularly in their, Health -wise. Uh, their compound. Um, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, we know what happened to Heaven's Gate. Now that was that was a different situation. Obviously, the Heaven's Gate cult. Uh, they it was, and we're getting a peek into the the clip but, that you showed last week about the cleanliness of the compound itself. Now, Emma, you you didn't detect any disarray there. I guess you would have mentioned it, but we yeah. hear talk did they even of have facilities grease? in the bathroom to wash your hands? They did. I mean, and, and Tim was actually quite thoughtful and he put makeup out for me and told me before the show that, that I had, that I, that's a true story. There was some makeup in oh. there for me. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was for the shine well, from the lights. Yeah. I was a female guest and he wanted to, to put, you know, maybe that's why it was more clean than, than, than tip, it typically is. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, that was, then afterwards when he wanted me to hang out and I didn't, you know, it, it just because I didn't love the vibe at the compound. Maybe I was picking up on some of what 
you you figured out Tim, and and that's when he said I was a pedophile. Um, well, I wanted to get to that. You called me a pedophile too. You oh. both you both uh, were uh, accused of being pedophiles, um, and um, I, I I don't know where uh, how Tim can make that conclusion. It seems a little bit um, uh, uh, spurious uh, to me. I mean, uh, you know, slanderous. Yes, slanderous. I think that's uh, certainly arguable. Hmm. Um, it does feel like Tim is under a lot of duress these days. But before we get to that, I want to ask you one other thing, because I know that, um, you know, you've also uh, probably played a psychiatrist uh, in sketches, uh, certainly a therapist. Uh, and in many ways, uh, what you do provides a therapeutic relief for people. So I think you're qualified to answer this question. What's going on with his co-host ian i'm glad you brought him up wanting to follow him to the bathroom yeah i mean we do did we hit that hard enough yeah, get, the, i think we should can we play that again it's worth because, checking it out again because this is there are courtier relationships in certain like um you know that you read about in certain mm -hmm. times there there certainly were eras where the boss Yes. Of a certain situation would never go to the bathroom without I, someone helping. I told you of the example of, of medieval kings. They The top servant for kings was the one that would use his hand to wipe the king's ass because the king was above wiping his own butthole with his own hand. Well, also, if you're not washing your hands in a facility like, for instance, their, their uh, studio invariably tim's got to shake hands with different people and so maybe i don't know but let's watch this clip again here this segment where ian his um his sort of like his uh, uh Villa, i guess in a way uh says, boy robin yeah i i will follow you into the bathroom yeah. for some reason Very what, 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 <laughs> Ian's having a what's real... ian what ian freaks like the choice ian makes here ian is to Tim's little toady here. Watch this. Or Josie, or, or somebody wants to jump and take my seat. Uh, now, why don't you guys both come up for a minute? Uh, I'm feeling real sick. I'm really. Bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Uh, I'm going to go. Why is Tim? Why is Ian going to the bathroom? He doesn't want to be alone with DJ. Don Jr. looks scared too. Yeah. And so Don <laughs> actually gotta, kind of. I, I think he's fairly pleasant here, but take a look. I, I try. I got. A, I got the drink because I'm like I just got punched in the gut. <laughs> so you want to sit in for like 10 minutes or so? I'm going to go to the bathroom and listen to you guys and then I'll come back. What? Listen to what? You <laughs> done, done, done. You're the one supposed to stay. It's, yeah, yeah. I like... <laughs> okay. Man. Um, so, right. so... I like... Uh, I like uh, I'm going to go to the bathroom and listen to you guys. <laughs> I don't think... I think that came out wrong or has he got a long extension cord on those headphones? What is the listening in bathroom? Is he, is he like doesn't want... To, I mean, there's two ways to look yeah. at this. Uh, one way could be that um, Ian doesn't want the guys filling in to feel self-conscious and that they would if Ian was around. Now, it sort of begs the question, isn't there another place to go besides the bathroom to not be there when they're doing that? Or is he going there to help Tim? I mean, do I you think, think it's possible that... He's got to hold the beanie. Do you think it's possible that Tim I think he's going to prep the... I'm sorry. I think he's going to prep the space. I think there's a fair amount of prep that goes into the relief that Tim is about to experience. I mean, or, I mean, is it, do you think that this is a regular occurrence? Like, do you think that it's possible that Tim never goes to the bathroom without Ian having, you know, set up the situation? It just so it happens that in this situation, there was an urgency that isn't always present. Sure. I think we're looking at an, uh, a, a peek into into their normal routine, but we, we, because of the bacterial infection that we can only assume was occurring due to uh, poor hygiene, uh, again, this is just based on what, what I've heard. I'm not, I can't say for sure what's going on, but uh, I, I think, I think, yes, on a regular basis, you know, if Tim's going to relieve himself, relieve his bowels, I don't think it's something he needs Ian for, for bladder issues. That's just, let me just get out in front of that one. Well, I think Tim is demonstrated he's capable of, I'm sorry. 
aim i mean it's not necessarily no. bladder associated but it could be aim uh, <laughs> or to strap see, him yeah. in could be modesty issues the queen of england used to have somebody proceed her to the bathroom and drop a banana to make sure you couldn't hear anything fall into the water <laughs> so i didn't know that hmm. yeah. I suspect, uh, I mean, I suspect, or maybe just, yeah, he clears out people so like, so that Tim can go in private. Um, has Tim referenced this since that happened? I mean, that's got to be, I, I'm curious. I have to look into that. I don't know if it's something he'd want to return to. I don't know if he returned that night. Did he, was that the last we saw of him that night? I, My I, reporting kind of ended um, on the subject <laughs> uh, minutes after that clip. Yeah, you, you have to understand. Yeah, no, I I and totally understand. Tied up I mean, with other things, and and sometimes a topic becomes a busy just time. too hard to wade through. Uh, at one point, do you, is it your sense? Let's let's pull pull out um, because, like you say, you are a um, an observer of uh, of of Tim Pool. I know that you uh, both uh, have played a critic of uh of 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 of, of video and and film mm -hmm. and television film, yeah. and also um at various times also i think um you've made analysis of things so let me ask you this do you think uh there's something going on with him like i mean is this part uh was this an isolated event uh, event or do you think that there's something more because he's had like explosive uh, bouts of anger uh, yeah, I listen. I think he's at a breaking point. I think the bean he's about to pop. If there's not a civil war or a world war in the next three to six months, he's done. Like, what's the point? I mean, it, he's been gearing for this. He's been calling for. I don't. What do you think he wants? A, do you think he wants a civil war or a world war more? It's hard to tell. The froth in his mouth when he talks about civil war is pretty palpable but he also gets pretty excited about the uh the idea of a world war three of course well is that so, new is world war three new because civil war we've been he'd been ramping up the idea well it, before he said you know trump was gonna win what was it like 48 states or something like that 49 yeah it was, it was quite possible um now then now was also you know civil wars happening it feels like maybe when I when I spoke to him, he he didn't he had a lot of opinions about Ukraine funding, but didn't have anything to say about Israel funding. Um, so he's I, I, maybe I now that. he's learning a little bit more about the world at this point, and that's perhaps his more pressing concern is World War Three. Now is that's now that he's become a little bit more foreign policy focused. He sees it. He sees the the chess pieces coming into play, and and. Uh, he was uh, there was a, a clickbait video of his a couple days ago whenever Biden when they launched the first retaliation or whatever response to the to the Houthi. attack on our the, oh, yeah. the, no the Jordan, soldiers right? that were killed yeah uh, he says uh, we're hours away uh, from World War Three wow well. I mean, that was four days ago. So well, you want to keep watching. But, in case I mean, he's it's right. not like you can't. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you can't count time in hours, even if you're. You know, it adds up to yeah, years and thousands years and years of and decades hours, decades yeah, yeah. and uh, hundreds mm -hmm. and millions of hours. I mean, that's conceivable. But he also sounds like there's two things that dynamics that seem to be going on. One is uh, he seems to be really uh, tired of doing his uh, his his afternoon show is becoming yeah. a burden. And the other is it sounds like there's someone trying to sabotage him. I mean, with, I and I want to bounce this. I want to. I wanted to bounce this theory off of you because I know that at uh, some time maybe you've uh, played uh, law enforcement in a sketch or maybe a lawyer or a prosecutor of some sorts. Uh, oh, yes. And so you're uh, definitely qualified to make this assessment. But if someone's pouring bank and grease down your uh, <laughs> your 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 plumbing, they're they're trying to undermine yeah. the infrastructure of your building now. There's a lot of different things that could happen. Uh, you block up the septic. You're unable to uh, relieve yourself, which apparently is a problem uh, for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it cuts into the hygiene. But then it also could uh, somehow inhibit the, the water supply. Uh, my point is, is there someone on that compound who is possibly either trying to oh. poison yeah. uh tim or, or just there is there is there subterfuge going on 
look, let's look at the let's look at any given night on the Tim cast. You've got four to five people surrounding Tim, right? There's usually I would say four people. Sometimes there's five people there. Uh, and and compare that to national averages of FBI informants. I mean, statistically, <laughs> one of those five is an FBI informant. I don't know if it's Ian or the muscle man with the big beard. Right. Or the guy with the funny t-shirts or the the rotating uh, list of uh, women he has on the show. Uh, that I don't know who it is, but it's, I mean, it's, it's statistically uh, very, very probable that it's, that one of them is an FBI informant. And, and do you think that one of them could be trying to uh, uh, undermine so his yeah, siege well, that's what FBI, pre that, preparation. Uh, Sam, oh, this that's is sort of like CoinTelPro. This is like CoinTelPro uh, type of yeah. situation. Yeah, it's a black hat op. <laughs> black hat op. Black <laughs> beanie op. Yeah. Let me uh, ask you about the beanie. Um, I, 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 we've mentioned already that you've probably played uh, a psychiatrist or a therapist. What, based upon that? having played one of those characters uh in real life what would one of those people do you think would how they would assess his compulsive uh wearing of that hat it doesn't seem like now i've come across i want to be fair i've come across uh, uh kids like this uh in elementary school and and certainly you know following uh covid there's a lot more anxiety amongst uh young children uh but he is he seems to be older than uh, like an elementary school kid. What yeah. is your assessment of that? Based so upon the, your having played uh, characters like that in a sketch. You know, I don't know if I could, I can approach that from a, a, a character place, from from my journalistic report uh, work on this and the sources I have. Um, it's not all pretty under there, I think Ooh. is what's going on. I think from what I understand, and again, I don't have any... Uh, I, I can't verify this. this. This is coming from secondhand sources. There were some very, very scary uh, negative side effects from some, uh, I think it was Roman or it was a product that you, an over-the-counter, I should say an over-the-counter uh, hair growth uh, supplement. Uh, un, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was Roman. I think it was probably something a little more uh, untested, I should say. And oh, apparently geez. it's fairly... It's let's just say it's not something you'd want to look at for a long period of time. Whatever's happening up there, wow. That's just what I've what I've heard from some people that are fairly uh, uh, intimate with the situation. I mean, it sounds like you have at least um, one or two sources there. I would never press a journalist on never speculate naming on their sources thing. or something like that i but. just couldn't sam you know i just couldn't and you understand that no I've, i i i i get it i've uh, interviewed uh, many many reporters in the past um all right one other question what's greg like <laughs> <laughs> is he one of the guys on the show on the uh, or, uh or sits around that sits around tim which greg are you talking about um no i'm telling you like, greg, uh, greg. we got a bunch of greg heads around here uh well and, greg uh, is is like my ian I see. Okay. I love Ian. I I feel bad. I feel like someone's going to hurt Ian at that table, though. I mean, the I, more he he well, pipes I, in my with sympathies some wacky lie with stuff. Ian as well. He's I wound mean, a little bit tight. I think. I, I my sympathies lie with Ian, yeah, and is. I. What also, was Ian like in person, Emma? I never met was Ian. I, I, I. Oh, he wasn't there. I walked past him in. Oh really? Yeah. I he wasn't there for for the interview. I I saw him coming like, in as I was exiting. Which is the the point where I didn't see the uh, the full skate park that Tim was upset about. Um, but when I was exiting, I think I said this before. There were other guys around because there's like fifteen people. Or yeah, the boys. Of, there's a lot wow. of people there at any t any given time. Boish. And they were uh, pranking another one of the the boys. Pranking. Pranking by putting a Ukraine flag on the bumper sticker <laughs> because. Oh, <that's> funny. <laughs> you know, funny. it's funny to that's support stuff. Su support Ukraine. Yeah. That's good stuff. I, when all uh, this goes away, though, will they stay in West Virginia? I mean, there's just so many questions, Sam, Emma. I don't know how we're going to well, get to the bottom uh, country of Country roads might take I got to go to the compound. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, e and I am very sympathetic with. I think that, um, and also, it would, you know, it would be nice to have someone who, you know, 
it would be nice to have someone go to the bathroom before I am and just make sure that it's okay in there. Okay in there. Ready to go. There's paper towels. Yeah. There's toilet paper. Drop a uh, a banana. Uh, but uh, do you want to, um, Tim? Do you want to uh, 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 plug anything? Your uh, uh, ten steps to unlocking your source code. Is that? Uh, is that coming out uh, soon? No, it's uh, we're we're still working on that. It's a that's the beta edition without anything inside yet. But uh, yes, oh, the, wait, uh, you know, the, I want to also ask you about uh, your uh, Patrick Bet David. Have you been on his show oh yet? God. No, but did you want? I mean, I, dare I uh, give Bill Maher a compliment? He had he was he sat down with he sat down with Bill Maher for Club Random. It's fantastic he because did? I don't think Bill Maher knows who. Like, there's so many people who don't know who the hell Patrick Bet David is. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Boom. And and he sits down with Bill Maher, and Bill Maher clearly doesn't know who he is. He's just like, you got to get this guy on the show because he's got a lot of hits or something. And Bill Maher shows him such little respect, and it's pretty funny because it's just like, who the who the hell are you? Like, what is, what is the deal with this guy? He's such a clear huckster. That seems like a hard thing to watch because I don't know who oh, they're both, to uh I know who, but, who to dislike you know. more. But Mar is very fu- it's very funny to give Patrick Bet David the energy of like Mar literally says Who is this guy? As he winds up to talk about I don't know vaccines or something he's like oh this is going to be stupid. <laughs> Yeah. yeah no, no. Exactly. Mars dismissiveness you captured quite well in your uh in your your retelling of it in yeah. in uh when you had that contentious interview with Fred Armisen. But did you yes. see the news yesterday that Kanye did a two hour episode with Bill Maher that Bill Maher on Club Random that will never see the light of day, according Oh no to Bill Maher. T- so I He's just gonna shelve it. It's like the the day the clown cried. I I desperately <laughs> desperately want that footage. Like I would like to see oh, yeah. the interaction between those yeah. two people because it's probably horrible. And and like the the day that the clown died, they actually did it in a backdrop uh, of the Holocaust. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 like, uh, yeah. <laughs> it says uh, Mach uh, Ben Fry, I think, right above the uh, set. Mm. I don't. That was also but a I, weird choice for him to do. The Patrick Bet David show is, is quickly overshadowing the Tim Pool experience for me. You got to get into it because there's this guy Vinny. Do you know Vinny? Oh, I, I've been He's, in the uh, vault. Oh, that's right. You did. You did. I, the show. I was What's, down the in Florida in the vault uh, with these guys. Vinny, and, he gets real up. He gets real agitated real quick. <laughs> Well, that's his job. He's Which the one. He's, yeah. he's the smart one. Oh, no, he's no, the, he's the one that yeah, looks and sounds super like smart the guy. word Vinny. The one like that really looked, got upset with Sam is Adam Sosnick. Oh, the, Adam, Sosnick. Sosnick is the guy in the left with the blazer. Vinny's oh, the guy. He's in the, sort of the, Vinny's Ian guy of in the right show. of you. Oh, the guy. Yeah, he, Sosnick's he's like kind of the Ian, Ian of, of that PVD. Show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, the one with the lip fillers. Yes. yes. Yeah. He's, oh, Vinny he's like didn't say much when I. Vinny was didn't there. say much when you were on, but Sosnick was really not happy with you for the most part. That's it. That's oh, you got to watch Ian. You, I mean, you got to watch Vinny and uh, Steve Schmidt go on. Go 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 at it. It's fantastic. Veins. Oh. Like you really? see Vinny's veins, he's sweating and he's he can't handle it. He's Is he the enforcer there? I, yeah, I, I, I feel the, like I probably physically intimidated him when I was there, and so he didn't say yeah. much. He wears uh, like today's man wedding suits with like just the vest, like the shirt, the tie, and the vest, but no you know, like that look. Uh-huh. It's fantastic. They're fantastic. I love well, them all. I, I hope you get invited down there into the uh, to the vault. They they do shoot it in a <laughs> vault. It's a former like bank in like, like sort of like a strip molly type of thing. Yeah, get in the mindset. There's a lot of. I will say this: to walk into their facility and to realize like um, this guy has poured in a tremendous amount of money into this. Uh, as an investment, and it's unclear to me how he thinks it's going to pay off. Well, well no, it's, it's clear to me. It's yeah. It's it, not just entertainment; it's valuetainment. Right. It has value, and it's just unclear to me. Like, I, I feel like I, I, I'm curious as to what point he says, like, okay, um, fifty million was enough uh, to put in yeah. to see if I could jumpstart this. That was an interesting There's, experiment. There's this moment on Club Random where they're talking about Biden and and Bill Maher's like I, I'm gonna vote for him like if, like he's not my favorite guy but what, you know blah 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 and uh, Patrick's like let me ask you this like are you a results oriented guy <laughs> and Bill Maher's like uh, sure yeah uh, why wouldn't I be? like everybody is like. 
what are you talking about? No, yeah. I don't like it when things work Happen. out. Happen. Yeah. You know, no, like, I don't do just, anything for any purpose. For all those buzzwords. It's amazing. The whole shtick is like everything that you hate about like a corporate presentation that you might have had to attend, but like <laughs> funneled into political discourse. And it's like none of these things really fit. Yeah. I well that's that's the segue to my plug is the new season of On Cinema is currently streaming on the High Network it's H E I network TV and we we're heavily inspired this year by the the uh, Valuetainment gang I think you'll see it in our I've, set design I've I've uh, I've, yeah. I've I've seen that in the uh, yeah. thing in the uh, in the book the high, what is this yeah. High Network what is that? I don't get it it's not that hard. It's um, it's our it's our it's our streaming service for on cinema. And, no, but uh, what what why the high network? I don't well, get that's it. my name. H e i. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's pretty that's much just it. the first part of it. Like that would. That's right. Yeah. Well, we don't want to do the Heidecker network. We get some you know too many Nazis joining. Okay. I, I still I don't not quite clear on it. But okay, that's fine. That's per, did, Emma, does it make sense to you? Yeah, it's it makes just sense. A name. It makes sense to me. Said Peacock, network. anyone? Said network. It's, it's like Peacock with better content. Said network. I would never do that. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, well, uh, 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 Tim, I'm I'm glad that we could uh, put aside. Uh, yes, some I'd like to propose a rule. I'd like to propose a rule. I'm uh, I'm currently in Toronto, and I say whenever I'm whenever we're sharing the same time zone, we have nice cordial conversations like this one. Okay, that's fair. Seems, that's fair. Seems like an irrelevant Coast. rule. Doesn't matter really, but let's try to shoot for that. Okay, that Baby sounds steps. good. That sounds good. And if you're uh, ever in this uh, general vicinity of where we are in uh, Brooklyn, uh, please let us know and. Um, I mean, we'd still probably want to do it remote, but uh, it would be nice to have you. I'll sit back there with those goons back there with all the computers. Oh, yeah, you can see that. Yeah, that's not even. <laughs> all right, Tim. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Uh, appreciate your time today. Bye, Tim. Thank right. you. Bye. 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 All right, uh, folks. Oh, wait, we're in the fun half. Yeah, we're actually yes. going to be fully switching over to the fun half because we left it open a little bit longer for the people. I don't know why we did that. Um. Mari 55, as a former IRS agent analyst, just wanted to clarify that it takes at least three to five years to become proficient as an experienced IRS agent that is capable of auditing large, complex corporations. Yeah, you got to go through all the DEI. So there'll be lag time in seeing results from this IRS increased funding. Uh, Dago Lefty, I've lived, Sam, I've lived in uh, San Diego for over 35 years, and yesterday during some unusual torrential rain, I got a tornado warning alert on my 